All right, so part two of my explanation on VLANs. This objective is going to specifically look for you to explain the uses of VLANs and how they are configured. So let's do a quick review from before. I had said that VLANs address issues such as scalability, security, and network management. Network architects set up VLANs to provide network segmentation. Routers between VLANs filter broadcast traffic, enhance network security, perform address summarization, and mitigate network congestion. Anything else you can remember from the previous video about why VLANs are good, you can also go ahead and tell me what those are as well. So before we looked at this paragraph right here where there's a lot of vocab, it says in a network utilizing broadcasts for service discovery. It's going to say some other things and then in the sentence with the frequency of broadcasts also increase or increases. A lot of big companies care about network discovery or service discovery, I mean, by using network broadcasts. So we need to keep the number of um, devices on the network small. Well, relatively speaking, that is. So what VLANs can do is help us manage this broadcast traffic by forming multiple broadcast domains. So breaking up a large network into smaller independent segments reduces the amount of broadcast traffic each network device and network segment has to bear. So breaking up is good to do. In an environment employing VLANs, a one-to-one -one relationship often exists between VLANs and IP subnets. Although it is possible to have multiple subnets on one VLAN, but if you don't want to break your brain working through something like that, I would just suggest uh, keeping each VLAN to a particular subnet. Now at the point of you watching this video, you should probably be familiar with subnetting. I have many, many vi videos on this concept because it is kind of a rough one. But man, it really is a simple one. Let me just briefly explain that subnetting is creating small networks out of just the largest network that exists, the internet itself. So it, it, there's many reasons for us to subnet, but probably the biggest one is to preserve IP address space. So go watch those videos if you can. Subnetting is even a fun thing we do in class and turn it into a competition. So without VLAN capability, users are assigned to networks based on geography and are limited by physical topologies and distances. VLANs can logically group networks to decouple the user's network location from their physical location. So in summary, VLANs are giving us this great flexibility that the physical world could not offer us. Oh, and that's what it says right here. VLANs provide the flexibility to adapt to changes in network requirements and allow for simplified administration. VLANs can be used to partition a local network into several distinctive segments. For instance, you could have a production network in your company. Maybe you have a voice over IP section. And then here's one you can do at home, a storage area network. You can create your own storage area where maybe you keep your movies or family photos. Having family photos on a RAID, that way you have these backups, is a really good idea. And this picture, by the way, is a little confusing because, like, here's your two routers, and it says SAN right here, but the, the storage area network is really these three that the routers are allowing the computers to get to. So maybe the program right here, you see the little envelope, maybe the program that allows email to run is here, but the emails themselves may very well be stored in one of these uh, network storage devices. And I assume optical storage here could be like those old school hard drives, the spinning disks one. But look at our tape library over here. Tape storage is really interesting. If you ever watched the old movies about computers, these things were pretty expensive. But the computer might be here doing the processing and the computer is going over here, like literally across the room to get some of the data that it needs from storage. And you'll see these things jerking and moving in all kinds of ways. You should probably YouTube that since I'm just showing you pictures. But they jerk and move because this is not like random access memory. This is sequential memory. So whatever data is at a particular point in the tape, it will need to be physically moved to that point wherever the head is that's reading that data. And I heard tape storage is still a thing. Apparently it's a very reliable way to store data, so... Let's get back on topic here. In cloud computing, VLANs, IP addresses, and MAC addresses in the cloud are resources that end users can manage. 
Now, to help mitigate security issues, placing cloud-based virtual machines on VLANs may be preferable. So you want your cloud-based data on a VLAN. This may be preferable to placing them directly on the internet. So I assume that means just like directly on a server that's not separated into a VLAN. Now, I assume only one of these words will look familiar to you, but these are the technologies that have VLAN capability. Like, if I have an Ethernet cable in the room, well, it's actually called a Cat 5 or 6 cable, whatever. So if I have these cables in the classroom and we're using Ethernet to get us the Internet and get us access to each other, if I'm using the Ethernet protocol, I have the ability to create a VLAN. And a fun historical kind of story, um, it says here that after successful experiments with voice over Ethernet from 81, 84, so that's crazy, we're talking the 80s here, Dr. W. David Sinkowski joined Belcor and began addressing the problem of scaling up Ethernet networks. At 10 megabits a second, Ethernet was faster than most alternatives at the time. However, Ethernet was a broadcast network, and there was no good way of connecting multiple Ethernet networks together. So this limited the total bandwidth of an Ethernet network to 10 megabits. So maybe people who are especially aware of how much data that their internet service provider is providing them, at least the speed that they provide, this number should look pretty small to you. And again, we're in the 80s right now. So Ethernet was having this limitation, as well as a physical limitation between nodes of only a few hundred feet. So Sinkowski invented VLANs, and he did this by adding a tag to each of the Ethernet frames. These tags could be thought of as colors, say red, green, or blue, I'm picturing the different colors that cat cables come in. And in this scheme, each switch could be assigned to handle frames of a single color and ignore the rest. The networks could be interconnected with three spanning trees, one for each color, and by sending a mix of different frame colors, the aggregate bandwidth could be improved. So there's a beautiful visual for you here. We're looking at an Ethernet frame. Uh, students who have spent time with me on this, uh, this should look really familiar. We got our typical stuff like a preamble, destination Mac, source Mac, but here the bottom one is the VLAN. Here's the extra bytes we add to a frame when we're working with a VLAN. And so the standard they came up with for this is 802.1Q. So this guy's work finally saw a standard around 2003-ish. Uh, but not everyone's going to use this standard or this protocol. They're going to come up with other ways, even proprietary ways, to create VLANs. More on that in a second, though. Let me give you some humor relief here. Since we're thinking about network topology, I found a funny Dilbert comic. He says, here's your problem. The connection to the network is broken. Uh-oh, it's a token ring LAN. So that means the token fell out, and it's in this room someplace. And then the boss there goes ahead and spends time looking for it. He has no idea what a token ring network is. Dilbert ends by saying, I'll wait a week and then tell him the token must be in the Ethernet. Well, I did do some research to see if token ring is still being used. And according to the sysadmin subreddit, it is a yes, but still very rare. There's the link right there if you want to read up on that yourself. So around 2003, we have this official standard 802.1Q. The protocol is commonly used today to support VLANs. The IEEE working group defined this method of multiplexing in an effort to provide multi-vendor VLAN support. So we don't want, well at least I don't, I'm just such a big open source guy, I don't want vendors having these proprietary secret protocols that I can't like digest or look at if I wanted. Part of the IEEE's goal probably is to get everyone on this standard. The other options would be Cisco's InterSwitch Link, ISL, and 3Com's Virtual LAN Trunk. And then something that deserves its own video, uh, Cisco also implemented the LANs over FDDI, but let's try to focus here. This is still an introductory kind of concept, or at least an introductory video I'm trying to drop on you here. I want to make sure you understand what the word vendor is, just another word for company. And if you're reading networking articles or listening to networking podcasts like I do, you're going to hear the word vendor quite a bit. So just write your answer to that so I know you know. 
And for our last slide of the day, it says that in the context of VLANs, the term trunk denotes a network link carrying multiple VLANs, which are identified by labels or tags and inserted. These tags are inserted into their packets. Such trunks must run between tagged ports of VLAN aware devices, so they are often switched to switch or switched to router links rather than links to hosts. So we have Packet Tracer in the classroom. We should spend some time creating our own VLANs. So when you think of the word trunk, don't think this trunk. Think of a trunk as like a cable that is carrying multiple networks on that cable. And you can even label that cable right there in Packet Tracer. Oh, I lied, sorry, one last slide, and this is just a fun fact slide. It is saying that using this standard, the maximum number of VLANs on a given Ethernet network is about 4,000, and that's all because of a 12-bit VID field we have. I assume that stands for VLAN ID. So we got 12 bits to be able to represent what type of VLAN that data is uh, looking for or coming from. And so then apparently there's some tricks you can play with 802.1aq, also known as shortest path bridging. So you can play this little trick here to expand the VLAN to 16 million. That is a humongous number. So there you go, VLANs, really powerful and cool. What are VLANs solving and what configuration makes them different than an average LAN network? You know Professor H loves his bits and bytes. Tell me what's different at that level.